I'm here with former Democrat Tulsi Gabbard for a special online-only segment. Tulsi, I appreciate your staying with us and uh, continuing some of the conversation. Have, have you had people that came up to you and said, you're a traitor, you've left the party, <laughs> you've left our country's values. Has that happened? Yes. Okay. I, I figured it probably did, and yes. people are angry at you. But it hasn't just happened over the last week. Uh, I had the distinction of... Uh, Hillary Clinton being one of the first people to say that a few years ago. She said you were a Russian asset. She I remember did. that. That was bizarre. Worse, worse than bizarre. Uh, it, it was obviously insulting to me as somebody who's proud to wear the, the, the nation's cloth. I'm proud to serve in uniform. Um, you know, I was serving in Congress at the time on the Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committees. Uh, getting highly classified briefings on national security matters facing this country. Um, it, was, it was offensive to me personally, but the bigger problem with what she said was the message that it sent to other servicemen and women, other veterans and other Americans, that if you dare to disagree with, with her and all that she represents in the permanent Washington establishment, then immediately you will be called a traitor, you will be smeared, your character will be assassinated, and they will seek to cancel your voice and take away uh, that right to free speech. And that, that is a dangerous message to send to the American people. And I think it's especially dangerous, as you say, to accuse someone who's serving in uniform, served in wartime in Iraq in 2005, and then to treat you as if you had betrayed your country when, in fact, you were standing up for the constitutional principles of free speech and yeah. freedom of assembly yeah. and the things that, quite frankly, we're free to disagree with each other. Absolutely. We can have all kinds of disagreement. But I'm not really free to call you a Russian asset, which is basically calling you a traitor, while you're in uniform as a lieutenant colonel in our military, yeah. for heaven's and, sake. And, and not backing it up with yeah. anything. And, and, and that's been the unfortunate thing about the tactics that the Democrat leaders have taken. But frankly, the permanent Washington Mitt Romney used the same language against me when I said something that he disagreed with. And when challenged to deliver the receipts, as the kids say these yeah. days, deliver <laughs> the evidence, if you're going to make an accusation like that, back it up with facts. And if you're serious enough to make that accusation, then make a complaint to my commander. Make a complaint to those who would actually prosecute me if I were to commit such a serious crime, which, by the way, in the military, for those veterans who are here know, that is something punishable by death. That's pretty serious. It's a very yeah. serious yeah. accusation. And, and they, they have never done it, though. They've never backed it up. Uh, again, so resort, rather than debating substance, differences, which is great. We yeah. should do that. It's immediately resorting to lies and smears. And it's something that's happening to a lot of candidates who are running for office right now as well. I want to get to some of the questions that our audience, and we'll get as many as we can. Uh, your view on constitutionalism and gun control. This is from Toastification. What an interesting <laughs> moniker, huh? <laughs> it is, um, you know, I think the, the statements that were made in the Supreme Court decision uh, with regards to New York's concealed carry law recently really, uh, really struck home for me and made me think about the Second Amendment in a way that I hadn't fully thought of before. And in that statement, it basically said, in summary, um, that the Second Amendment stands right alongside the First Amendment. And just like I don't need to go and get permission from any level of government to go stand on the street corner and say my piece and exercise yeah. my right to free speech, similarly, the Second Amendment should be treated the same way. The government doesn't have that right to infringe uh, on our rights. Uh, Given the increasingly authoritarian policies that we're seeing coming from this administration, again, the vision that our founders had for the Second Amendment, not only to provide us with the right to defend ourselves and our loved ones, but also to recognize that uh, this provides us with the opportunity to be that check and balance against a government that is moving towards tyranny. We have this question from Mark. He wants to know, what should be the first order of business for the new Congress and the new Senate to get to? What should they do? I've been very vocal about the biggest threat that we face right now, and that's the existential threat of nuclear war. Hmm. There are so many challenges that are impacting our kids and our families every day, and we need to tackle those. It is hard to be able to look forward to a tomorrow and building a better, brighter future for our kids when we are staring down the face of nuclear war because of this administration's proxy war with Russia that they are waging 
putting us all at risk and putting the world as we know it at risk. That, that is what I'm urging the president and leaders in Congress to take immediate action on, de-escalate the tensions, negotiate a, a, a peaceful outcome to this war so that we can actually focus on the things that we need here at home, using our taxpayer dollars to do that. We have a question from Dave from California. He says, please, will you run for governor of California? (laughs) (laughs) It would require a relocation, I realize, from Hawaii. (laughs) I don't know that I'm ready to move to California. I got to be honest. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't think I'd want to do it, but uh, at least you have one. I appreciate the trust, though. You start with a base of one. (laughs) There you go. Um, Some have asked this question. Do you plan to become a Republican? Is that something you're open to or you don't have any intention right now of just leaving an independence? Yeah, I, it's not something I'm thinking about, to okay. be honest. I, I will say that I see, um, I see a lot of uh, fractures in the Republican Party. We were talking about yeah. this a little bit before the show. Uh, different people want to move the Republican Party in different directions. But uh, I, I see potential, and just from my experience, uh, I have been treated with nothing but respect and kindness and openness from a lot of my Republican colleagues in Congress, many of whom I heard from over the last week. Mm. Uh, even though we agree or disagree on different things throughout the time I served with them, they've always been open. Uh, yeah. and, and again, kind. I can't say the same for a lot of my Democrat colleagues who, if I'm not falling in line with them, uh, am given the cold shoulder uh, I was heartened to see that there are still a, there are Republicans who are willing to take a courageous stand against wars that undermine our national security and put our people at risk. Uh, whereas recently, there were zero Democrats who voted against that forty billion dollar funding bill going to fund this proxy war with Russia. Sixty six Republicans took a stand in that. That was courageous and gives me some hope. That there's Dem- opportunity there. Democrats and Republicans have both voted to engage us in wars. Yes. And sometimes they extend the Iraq and Afghanistan war longest in our history. Most yes. people have not realized that. Maybe a, a simple question and just I'd love a simple answer. Why? Why have we continually engaged in long protract- protracted military actions? President Eisenhower warned us very clearly about the cozy relationship between the military industrial complex and members of Congress. And unfortunately, that is what, we are, what we've seen play out over the last decades. And it is a relationship get, that is getting closer uh, rather than having leaders who are looking out for our national security uh, and our well-being. You know, and I don't think anybody can say, well, you know, Tulsi's just a dove. She is anti-defense. I mean, for gosh sake, you've been in the military exactly. now for a couple of decades. Exactly. So it's, it's that, not those, like, those are the two attack lines. These, well, she's a pacifist or yeah. she, she's an isolationist. And both couldn't be further from the truth. I serve in uniform to protect and defend the security and freedom of this country and stand ready to deploy as I have to do exactly that. I just think that we need to be able to relate with other countries in the world without seeing dropping bombs as the only way to do it. Yeah. And we need to stop thinking that we can go and, or should go and try to be the policemen of the world and impose our will on other countries when almost every time we do that, we end up causing more harm than good. And the military industrial complex is the one that walks away with their pockets full of our taxpayer dollars. It's an incredibly bold and courageous position that you have taken. We're excited to have you here and deeply grateful for you coming, Tulsi. Thank you very much. If you'd like to learn more about Tulsi Gabbard, you can check out her new podcast. I've watched the uh, trailer for it. It's very, very well done. It's called, guess what? The Tulsi Gabbard Show. Now, how creative and original would that be, huh? (laughs) The Tulsi Gabbard Show podcast. And if you want more interviews with great guests like Tulsi Gabbard, You can subscribe to the Huckabee YouTube channel by clicking the button below and hit the like button as well.